Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. A man dressed in clerical garb stood in the doorway to MD psychiatrist Richard Gallagher's office and said, Forgive me, doctor, but I need help with an odd situation. He didn't know it at the time, but these ten words would change everything the doctor thought he knew about the human psyche and demonic possession. I'm Dave Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Dark Mysteries, The Queen of the Church of Satan. When Father Jacques dropped by Dr. Richard Gallagher's office that morning, he did have an unusual request. You see, Father Jacques was an exorcist, charged by the Catholic Church with the task of expelling demons from afflicted individuals. His problem was that most people who believed they were possessed by demons were actually just suffering from some sort of a mental illness, and the priest was wasting countless hours of not only his time, but his patient's time as well. His odd request was for Dr. Gallagher to sit in on his preliminary exams and rule out possible mental illness early on. This was something risky for the doctor and his reputation. Studying anything paranormal is usually taboo for anyone in the field of science for fear of being ostracized. But Dr. Gallagher always had a curious fascination with the subject, and he assumed that he'd probably just sit in and rule out demonic possession for all of the priest's subjects. After some consideration, he agreed to help the priest. The first case Dr. Gallagher observed was a woman who said she was being assaulted by invisible forces. The woman and her husband were devout Catholics, and they believed they were being attacked by evil spirits. At the time, although Gallagher was a practicing Catholic, he approached the priest with skepticism. To his surprise, the priest liked that. Well, if we didn't think you were skeptical, Dr. Gallagher, the priest told him, we wouldn't have wanted to use you. When Gallagher examined the woman, he found multiple bruises that would spontaneously appear. He ordered a battery of tests, including blood work, an EEG, and a CAT scan, all of which were negative. While her bruises did show a superficial resemblance to a few disorders, such as psychogenic purpura, her history was very different from any organic pathology. It didn't seem to be explainable on the basis of any medical or psychiatric pathology, he recalls, she appeared to me to be completely sane. I had never seen a case like that before. Gallagher had determined that there was no medical cause for her injuries. To his surprise, Dr. Gallagher was unable to diagnose her with any mental illness, and Father Jacques was then able to conduct his exorcism. Dr. Gallagher had been expecting to be able to easily debunk these potential demonic possessions and was perplexed by the case, but nothing would prepare him for the next case Father Jacques was about to bring to his door. The night before the priest showed up to Dr. Gallagher's door with Julia, before he even knew she existed or that Father Jacques had planned on showing up, he and his wife were woken around 3 a.m. by the sound of screeching. The family's two normally docile cats were viciously attacking each other to the point where the startled couple had to physically pull them apart. It was completely unlike them to behave like that, but they chalked it up to bad cat food or catnip and thought nothing more of it. The next morning, Father Jacques showed up to Dr. Gallagher's office with a woman probably in her late 30s, early 40s. She was dressed in all black with jet black hair and eyeliner, a style that he later learned was the preferred look of her fellow cult members. He introduced her as Julia. Dr. Gallagher reached out to shake her hand, but Julia just smirked and said, how'd you like those cats last night? Dr. Gallagher just stood there, shocked. His expression apparently amused Julia, whose smirk broadened into a grin. What are you amused, he blurted out, surprising himself by his sudden outburst. Dr. Gallagher was rattled by his first meeting with Julia and wondered for the rest of the day what he had gotten himself into. He called Father Jacques later that day and asked him what the hell he was thinking bringing her to him. The priest apologized profusely, explaining that he had no other options. She genuinely wanted to be helped, but she didn't respect the Catholic religion. She had done similar things to other priests who tried to help, but she would just mock them. He figured a man of science might command more respect. 
Dr. Gallagher was annoyed and demanded the priest tell him exactly who he was dealing with. Father Jacques calmly explained that Julia was a high priestess in the Church of Satan and believed she was in the oppression stage of a demonic possession. He went on to explain that she does actually want to be helped. Needs to be helped, in fact. And sooner rather than later, since the cult is unwilling to let her go and will do anything to stop the continued exorcisms. He also explained that powerful Satanists like Julia, who have committed themselves to Satan, can be granted certain privileges, like psychic powers, not only in their possessed state, but also in their conscious state. Dr. Gallagher and Julia met numerous times over the span of the next several months. During that time, he did end up earning her respect, since he was a man of science and not another pious priest. He learned that she had been a member of the same satanic cult for years and moved up in the ranks to high priestess. They referred to her as Queen Lilith and worshipped Asmodeus, the demon of lust. They would hold black masses using stolen robes and Eucharist hosts to mock Christianity. Sex was a major part of these rituals and Julia developed a taste for Daniel, the cult leader. He ran the ceremonies in full satanic garb and was the most powerful cult member. Julia had originally thought that he had cared for her in a special way, but was beginning to wonder whether or not his feelings were authentic. She felt that as of recently, her value to the cult had been diminished, causing Daniel to lose interest in her. Dr. Gallagher asked what she meant by that, and for the first time, she seemed cautious and deliberate in choosing her next words. I was the cult's main breeder, she admitted. Her role as high priestess meant that she would be the one to get pregnant. There were cult members who were able to perform abortions that they would use as human sacrifices for their black mass ceremonies. This is what earned her such a high status in the cult, but after years of doing this, she was afraid that she could no longer get pregnant. There was no evidence to support any of Julia's claims, but Dr. Gallagher felt as if she had no reason to lie to him, and had in fact heard of certain satanic cults doing this type of thing. After their meeting, he called Father Jacques to discuss. As he was filling him in, a loud voice interrupted their conversation, hissing, leave her alone, she belongs to us. Dr. Gallagher would have written this off as some sort of radio interference had the same voice not, on different occasions, come through the car radio and also from Julia herself, despite clearly not being her voice. Dr. Gallagher was truly perplexed by everything happening around Julia, things that there was simply no scientific answer for. Satisfied that there was no pathologic explanation for her affliction, he deferred back to Father Jacques, who convinced Julia to undergo another exorcism. She agreed. Dr. Gallagher was not allowed to be present at the exorcism since he was not affiliated with the Catholic Church. So, Father Jacques requested another exorcist priest, referred to as Father A. Father A was to take the lead since he was a far more experienced exorcist, and probably the most prolific exorcist of that time. The two priests and Julia piled into Father A's Chevy and took off down the dark road. They were headed to the chapel to perform the exorcism, but they never made it there. Almost immediately after they began their drive, spirits began to manifest in and around the vehicle. They appeared in front of the windshield, obstructing the driver's view, causing him to veer off the road and crash into a ditch. Everyone was unharmed, but the exorcism had to be postponed. When it finally did happen, everything started out pretty normal. Well, normal as far as exorcisms go. Lots of spitting, screaming, and cursing. Then, something unusual happened. Julia began to levitate 12 inches off her chair, and would have ascended even higher had she not been restrained by two nuns. The phenomenon was witnessed by both priests, two nuns, and two other unnamed individuals. She levitated for an hour, all of the time shouting blasphemies in different voices, speaking in several different languages that she could not have known. The exorcism ended, but was unsuccessful. The sad ending to this story was that Julia was never freed from the spirits that bound themselves to her. She ended up going back to the cult, and Dr. Gallagher never heard from her again. So what was this? An MD psychiatrist ruled out mental illness, and all experts involved agree that she could not have faked it. The facts of the case that perplex both men of the cloth, as well as a man of science, are what truly make this case one of the most bewildering dark mysteries. Stay tuned as myself, Jesse, and Rob discuss the Queen of the Church of Satan. What's 
going on, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Hometown Ghost Stories, Dark Mysteries. That was the Queen of the Church of Satan. And that was my voice you heard. I am joined, as always, by Jesse Wilkins. What's up, Jesse? What's going on? And also Rob Coakley. Great job introing the Dark Mysteries, Dave. We're so happy you're starting to do that. Also, it appears to be your mission to cover every exorcism that has happened in the history of mankind. So kudos to you for that. Yeah. So if you guys, you know, all of the main exorcism cases, if you guys don't end up covering them, I will because yeah. I'm going to, but this one was, um, I've been sitting on this one for a while and I was glad that you came up with this idea to cover dark mysteries as a side content thing, because I couldn't figure out how I would fit this into our regular episode. You know what I mean? Cause mm. the, all the names in it, with the exception of Dr. Gallagher, every single name in here is a pseudonym, right? Mm. Her name's not really Julia. Father Jacques, not really father Jacques. Father a is actually, um, they don't father name B. him is what He's father, B. father B. I think that he in this, So this is based off of, uh, Dr. Gallagher's book. One of the, one of his cases, these are all of his, uh, his case files basically in this book. And it's really interesting. I strongly recommend that it's called demonic foes, but he, I believe father B is also a different priest in this book, but he just doesn't, he doesn't use any names except for his own. Just mm. uh, part of that's probably from being a psychiatrist where he has to protect his patients. Yeah. But he probably just does that in his book. Also the Warrens do that a lot too. As you should. I mean, like it's, it's sensitive subjects unless they give you full permission. You don't want to just go out throwing out names unless it's Dave then I would say just throw his name out there. Right. Well, it's yeah. also so, like part of, it's also law. Like you can't just sort of information about patients. I'm above the law. As a uh, medical doctor, you know, as a MD psychiatrist, he can't. I didn't know you were. That for his patient, not me, no. <laughs> but him being that, he can't do that for his patients because of, you know, HIPAA violations or whatnot. But I feel like the Warrens do it, but they do it for more like of an insidious reason. You know, they're like, we can't release these names to you. And a lot of people kind of speculate that the reason that they don't release any names is because a lot of the stuff that they talk about just didn't happen, which I don't know if I believe or not. I like the Warrens. They but that's no flack. Fun. I mean, that, that's it. They're certainly, that their stories are crazy. I just actually got in the mail, I think my sixth of the Warren books. Nice. Which um, one? Satan's something. Or is that I the one remember. about? Yeah, I think I know that that's the uh, farmer, I think. I haven't read it yet. I think it's in Massachusetts though, or Massachusetts case, but hmm. either way, I haven't read it yet. So I do not know. But so I've gone through their books and some of this stuff is like, a, it's a lot. And you're like, did this all really happen? But for skeptics just to be like, well, they're not using the real names because it just didn't happen. It's just uh, like you said in the last episode, it's just lazy skepticism. Yeah. Yeah. No room for lazy skepticism on this show. Mm -hmm. But this this book, Demonic Foes, is really good. And I reckon if you guys haven't read it, I'll let you borrow it. But it's it's um it's basically this. I, I kind of broke it down a little bit in the intro there. He's a uh, MD psychiatrist who has a practice. I believe he still has a practice. He's got thousands of patients over his career. And he was in an interview once and he said, he asked the interviewer, he said, guess how many of, he's like, I've had thousands of patients. Guess how many of them have been actual demonic possessions? And they said, oh, I don't know. He's like, zero. Exactly zero of my patients that I've seen have had demonic possessions. And then this priest comes in and asks him for help to sit in on these demonic possession cases because the priest, you know, these exorcists get, I think we, we, we covered it on the Anna. Real Eklund. quick, is the, is the, does the priest come in after this interview? Is that what you're pointing at? Or? No, I'm sorry that, if I made that confusing. The interview has nothing to do with the priest. Okay. But um, no, this, this interview was more recent. So the priest gotcha. came in, the priest came to him, I think back in the late eighties, early nineties, right around there. Okay. And, uh, in this interview was recent. Sorry, so you're I didn't mean to cut you off. It just, it, it was a little confusing. So are you saying oh. that he doesn't believe that this case was demonic? He does. So this was not his patient. Oh. This was one of the people that the priest had brought to him. Well, if so, I wasn't confused before, now I'm even more confused. <laughs> so to be clear, his practice, he's a medical psychiatrist. So he has mm -hmm. patients that come in for, you know, medical, you know, psychiatric reasons for, for help within that field. None of those are demonic. This priest started presenting the priest's cases to him and said, will you sit on, sit in on my cases as an exorcist and rule out the people who are either faking it or have, you know, mental illness, whether it be, you know, Tourette's or epilepsy or what, whatever other these, any, any of these other 
you know, mental conditions that people mistake for demonic possession. Yeah, and kudos there. to the priest for being that thorough. Because a lot of people think with these exorcism cases that the priests are coming in and there's no medical professionals and it's just a bunch of priests who are just only dead set on exercising a demon. And I think a lot of folks think that uh, that the majority of these cases, they're not doing the due diligence of considering the very high possibility and probability that it's just a mental illness. In a lot of cases, I would say probably the vast majority of cases where people think that there is some sort of a possession going on, it's usually just a mental illness. But there are, as we continue to read into this and research these things, and especially with this case here, there are so many cases where it ends up that there is no scientific explanation yet. So yeah. it very well could be demonic possession. Yeah, a very, very, very small percentage are, are actually, according to the Catholic Church, demonic possessions. Now, the Catholic Church isn't the only body that does exorcisms. I think every religion has their own version of demonic exorcisms that they do. Uh, but the Catholic Church is like the main one that you would go to. And they do thousands. So each exorcist has thousands of cases. I think there were hundreds. hundreds uh, we did. We went over the stats. And we the, went over the numbers in the Anaquind episode. And I, I yeah, I, I don't millions. have them. Yeah, I don't have them in front of me, but it's like, like millions million since 2018. Yeah, so it's just an insane amount. And it, like like we said, the majority of those are just misdiagnoses, misdiagnosed mental illnesses. So that's what this priest kind of wanted. And this medical doctor went in assuming because it interested him interested him and he went in assuming that he was just going to debunk them all and this book is interesting because he goes through several of the cases and a lot of them he does debunk as you know there was one case with a girl where she was young and she was in some sort of like youth sort some sort of like youth group with i don't remember if it was with a church or what but she uh she thought she was possessed and he was very polite about it obviously changed her name, but he said she was absolutely faking it. And, you know, the signs that she, the inconsistencies in her story and whatnot. And he basically went through like why they thought she was faking it and whatnot. And there are just a lot of very interesting cases in this book. So it's called Demonic Foes. It's by Richard Gallagher. And uh, I strongly recommend it. But the main story in this book was the one about Julia, who was the high priestess in this satanic cult, which is terrifying. So to go back, how did, how did she end up on in his office? So she had gone to, so she was in this cult and she fell in love with the cult leader named Daniel and Daniel, who at first seemed very interested in her. It's always a Daniel. Damn a Daniel. Listen. Damn Daniel. She thought he was interested in her. And then it started becoming more of like an, not just him and her thing. It became more of like a satanic orgy thing, which nice. she was all about at first. So. And, We've all been there. Yeah, no, it always starts with a Daniel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she felt that he, that he was less interested in her in her older age. So she was feeling not only rejected by the cult that she had devoted her whole life to at that point, but she was also starting to show signs of demonic oppression, which is the second stage of a full on demonic possession. So she actually went and sought out a priest. Now, this part of the story is weird because she sought out help from the priest, but then continued to disrespect the priest for being a priest. So it's like, what do you want? And I think that she might've just been conflicted. I think maybe she knew she needed help, like physically, mentally, like she knew that something wasn't right, but she went to a priest. She still is a Satan worshiper. She's still like, well, I need your help, but fuck you. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's weird, but but that's how she ended up there. And then the priest, the priest had brought her to a few different professionals, a few different priests. And he actually, and Richard Gallagher was actually not the first psychiatrist that he had brought her to. He brought her to other ones, and she did the same psychic prediction thing that she did with Richard Gallagher, not with cats, but just with other examples of that and just freaked them out. One of the psychiatrist's wife was like, get this demon out of my house. I don't want her mm -hmm. here. And most of the psychiatrists wanted no part of it. Richard Gallagher was just the first one who was like, yeah, I'll check it out. Let's see where it goes. And he it even does, had, it does seem like a weird move for her to go to a priest instead of like a hospital. If she was not feeling right, if it almost feels like maybe that was something that if, the, if this was a legitimate case of demonic possession, which it did sound like it was, that that was something that the demon was driving her to do. Like, go ahead. Let's, but let's she knows what she's dealing with, with, too. She's 
purposely been dealing with a demonic cult. So if you know what you're dealing with, you know where the remedy supposedly is, right? So it does make sense in that aspect. It's not uh, a lot of these that we cover. It just comes out of the blue. Like there, there's no rhyme or reason why that demon has possessed this particular person. In this case, we can wholeheartedly say yeah, like why we think this possession happened. And if that's the case, you probably know your best course of action to correct this situation. Yeah. So that's how she ended up at the priest. And you got to remember too, if you are, even if you're a Satan worshiper, I mean, that's part of the Christian religion, right? Technically it's like anti Christianity, but the devil Satan is still part of that religion. So yeah. it's not like, it, it's, it's almost like, what, what do you believe? What do you not believe? If you're a Satan worshiper, if you're a Satan worshiper, you must believe in God, right? So if you do believe, then you know that the remedy, like Rob was saying, the remedy to this situation, if you believe that you're possessed by a demon, is a priest. You're so, right. And while sat like Satanism or the Church of Satan sounds like it's like anti-religion, it's exactly the opposite. It's just the other side of that religion. Right. Exactly. So she sought out the priest for help. And I, and I feel like she was experiencing some cognitive dissonance. You know, she believes one thing, but doesn't want to believe the opposite. And she was kind of conflicted there. So that, I think that's kind of why you get a little bit of back and forth from her. But some of the stuff that she was doing and experiencing was insane. Like the cat prediction or the cat premonition thing. It was. Yeah. There, there's, it's just another case of some sort of a demonic possession going on in this. You see this in a ton of cases is one of the most common things is the person who's being possessed knows a bunch of stuff that they shouldn't know. They're able to speak languages that they shouldn't be able to speak. They know events from people's pasts, futures, present, things that just happened and things that they should have never known, things that people have never disclosed uh, with anyone. We right. saw this in the case uh, in Anna Eklund. In a, Anna Eklund, you see this in, in case case by case. Yeah, it's one of the consistencies the that you see with a lot of the demonic possessions. What's different about this one is that when the demon is making these predictions, not even really predictions, but like telling your secrets or reading your mind, basically, it's while there's a full on possession and there's the demon voice coming out of the person saying all these things, it's usually not the person in their conscious state. In this case, Julia was saying all these things in her conscious state. This wasn't like the demon voice coming from her. She was not in a state of possession when it happened. She wasn't even in an advanced state of demonic possession. She was in a stage of oppression where it's basically like the, the demon or the entity is trying to get inside you. Yeah, you it's know? trying to like just beat you down to make you vulnerable enough so it can take over. That's yeah. it. I mean, it's, it's a unique case because of her position with this cult. I mean, you're in a satanic cult, so it's it's... It feels like things could probably move faster with this, you know, demonic possession. Maybe it wasn't the oppression stage. Maybe they misdiagnosed that. Maybe it was further along than they thought it was. And things are getting mixed up because it's such a complicated case because of what she was involved in. Yeah, I, I can I can definitely see that. That does make sense. I haven't even hadn't even considered that. But so off the bat, Richard Gallagher, he sees this and he's like blown away because it was not what he was expecting. And if you think about it. You're somebody coming from the scientific angle, not supposed to believe in any of this stuff. No, he doesn't ever admit that he did originally believe in it, but he did admit that he was always curious about it and th thought it was interesting, which is why he initially took the case on to begin with. But to be able to, to see this off the bat and just be rattled like he was, was definitely an experience that he was not expecting. So he kind of went into this situation. Well, he went in, went in not being a believer in this at all. In fact, it seemed like he took some pride in debunking a lot of these things it's a starch difference from a pretty similar book that i read recently it was um i think it was called deliver us from evil and this was the case where it was a new york cop who was going along with a bunch of possessions a lot of times actually with ed warren but the way he wrote the book and the way he presented himself was a lot like ed warren himself where he's a very deeply religious guy. He knows what he's doing with these exorcisms. I mean, he's taking part and he's helping out with the priests and everything like that. But it's a big difference between these two people because it sounds like this guy was not a believer in demonic possessions. Maybe he is now. Has he, has he changed his position since seeing things like this? Yeah, he's definitely a believer now. And he's not only like, I believe in it. He's like, oh no, it's real. 
I'm telling you it's real. I've seen it. I've sat mm-hmm. in on demonic possessions. And anytime I hear somebody say, oh, that stuff's not real, I just laughed to myself and said, you've never seen it. You've never yep. seen what I've seen. And to come from somebody who has a medical doctorate right. degree. Yeah, I've gotten that from the priest at um, the church that uh, I mean, I'm a member of the church, but I work on Sunday morning, so I don't go there as often as, as often as I should. But one of the priests there, they do exorcisms. It's a Greek Orthodox church. And while I was doing catechism classes, basically to marry my wife, I had to become a part of their church. So I took classes for a year going to go visit with them and learn how they do things. It's very different than growing up. We went to kind of all sorts of different churches when we were growing up. But with this one, it was like you had to learn how to basically be a member of the Greek Orthodox church. But I was picking his brain about it because, you know, we, we'd bring up stuff and he knew off the bat that I already had a history and religion and I knew the Bible and stuff like that. But we were going over possession because I was picking his brain about it. I'm like, do you, you know, is possession real and all this and are demons real? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's like, we do exorcisms. He's like, I've been to many of them. I was like, oh, okay. So you've seen some stuff. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, he's like oh, it's like his confidence in it being real was more than you would get if you just ask like a question about Jesus to a priest and you expect them to be enthusiastic about it because they're a priest. But he's explaining, he's like, oh, yeah, we've seen, you know, it, almost every time things will shake in the house and plates will fall and candles will light up and go out and, you know, just, just your regular stuff. I'm like, oh, regular stuff. Yeah, that sounds normal. But this is what they experience in possessions. But to hear it from a guy like this, it's a whole different level because this is not a holy or was not a holy man at the time. It's a man of science, you know? Yeah. When you can convert a man of science over by seeing things like this, it makes you believe the story a little bit more. Yeah, it is. It's harder to... uh just it's harder to just dismiss him right not not that i don't really dismiss anybody because that's just lazy and rude but it is different when you hear if you hear someone who isn't a believer witness something that they now believe because they saw it right so it gets to the point where dr gallagher he has a whole bunch of interviews with her and she finally opens up to him and she basically breaks down how this satanic cult works which is alarming <laughs> now i've heard i've heard of this type of stuff before in other uh i have a couple books on the occult that i've read just out of curiosity and this is something that they do so a lot of them will do blood magic rituals in which they sacrifice usually animals whether it's goats chickens uh what, whatever what have you but the diehard satanist cults they like to brag that they do human sacrifices. Now it's hard to brag about doing human sacrifices because it's also illegal. <laughs> but what this this allegedly what this church did is they found a loophole, which is they have a high priestess who is the she was the main breeder of the cult, and she was the one that would get pregnant, and she was the one where they would perform the abortions and sacrifice that aborted fetus as their human sacrifice which is really disturbing stuff, but that's allegedly what they did. Now there was no, Dr. Gallagher, he mentioned there was no evidence that any of this actually happened aside from her testimony. But he also said that she had no reason to lie. And I, I think I agree with that, right? What would be the reason to make a story like that up? Unless you're trying to sensationalize and make things more intimidating to the people that you're dealing with right yeah i guess if you're trying to talk it up and really she, i guess how, if you're, many, how many times is that so much for a human body to go through yeah apparently apparently it was a lot because she said it happened you know she joined this cult in her 20s i believe she was and she was by the time she came to dr gallagher's office she was in her late 30s early 40s so we're talking could have been upwards of 20 years 15 to 20 years that she was doing this for which is a lot that's a um, lot so after this interview that Dr. Gallagher had with Julia, he has no other choice but to refer her back to the priest because he says, I can't find anything medically wrong with her. There's no pathologic explanation for the for the things that I'm witnessing. And her story honestly terrifies me. So he sends her back to Father Jacques, who brings in Father A, who we could probably guess who this ex- allegedly is like one of the biggest exorcists that there is out there or was at the time anyways. So there, there's a few names that I could probably pull up that this guy could be, but either way we won't do that because we don't have to speculate now. And there's a reason they call him father a for, you know? So, yeah. So the plan is to 
do an, do an exorcism and she finally agrees to it. So they had done a few initial exorcisms early on. And then she was like, I'm not cool with this anymore. I'm not comfortable with it. And that's when they brought in Dr. Gallagher. So finally they convinced her to do another exorcism. So that's when they call in father a, they get into her, get into his car and they leave. And this is another part of the story that is, I think very different from other ones was the spirits that start manifesting inside the car and around the car which got so bad that they blocked the windshield so that the driver couldn't see and then drove the car into a ditch. That's a new Deuce, one. Yeah, with the whole spirits blocking it, but we see this a lot with, with cursed possessions, exorcisms, is something going wrong with the vehicles. It's a reoccurring theme in a lot of these. It always seems to be when the priest leaves, when a person leaves, it, it's just something demonic is able to manipulate these vehicles. Yeah, that's a good point. You do hear it a lot with cars. And while the exorcism is like in progress or like while they're setting it up, a lot of things like that happen. And they say that's because the demon is trying to prevent the exorcism from happening because obviously demons don't like exorcisms. But once they did finally start the exorcism, that's when things get, I say get weird, but like get normal for an exorcism, right? It was, it was funny when you were talking about the the priest at your church that was that talks about it so like oh yeah yeah just normal exorcisms shaking and dishes falling you know stuff like that it kind of reminded me of what father a had said he's like it started out like a you know your everyday typical exorcism just screaming and spitting and swearing <laughs> like, yeah that's how my exactly. day starts every day <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know but basically this is where we hear a lot of the same things that we hear with other exorcism cases you hear the speaking in different tongues, different languages, different voices. And these are just consistencies that you hear all the time. Now, I don't know whether it means it's more or less likely to be a legitimate possession, right? Because I mean, consistency is good because that's how you scientifically prove things is repeat the same thing over and over to get the same results. But also at the same time, if someone's faking it, do they just know what to fake? Do they know the things to say, the things that you're supposed to do, the tropes? It's hard to say one way or the other. I think to an extent, if you do enough research, you could probably do a pretty good job of faking stuff. To an extent. But you have to be on the whole time. Yeah. Like if you're faking it, you have to be on like that entire time. And even some of the best actors can't do that, right? Like some actors can't um, stay in character the whole time. I mean, others do for the duration of shoots and stuff, but we're talking best actors on the planet type stuff. And you're going to, and that would be a hard role yeah. to keep up if and you're not. What are you forward. accomplishing? Yeah. <laughs> right. For what? It's, yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot to research and a lot to, to do to, to fake stuff. Yeah. One thing you can't fake is levitating a foot off the chair for an hour. Mm -hmm. That you can't fake. So again, we're in a situation where we have to take the word of all the people that were involved and all the mm -hmm. people that were involved were affiliated with the Catholic church. So if you don't believe any of it, you could just dismiss it all and say, well, I don't believe it. But then you're dismissing the testimonies of five or six people that were in the room and all have the same story. So the unfortunate part about this one is that it didn't work. They were not able, able to exercise the demons. And she was, I guess, disenchanted and went back to the cult. And no one ever heard from her again. So Which is a we very do. different ending than we normally get. Yeah. Yeah, you almost almost all of these, at least that we've covered, were resolved one way or another. Yeah, either the exorcism worked or temporarily worked. A lot of times they get possessed again later on down the line, but it seems that they would fight off the demon for a certain period of time and they would at least have some sense of normalcy for, you know, a couple of months or a couple of year, couple of years before maybe they have a lighter possession down the line and then that's easily, you know, a faster exorcism process if they have to do it. Because a lot of people do have to have multiple exorcisms, even when the exorcism is deemed successful. They have yeah. to later on. They, it's nothing to laugh at, but you have some of these ones where it's like, yeah, and, and it was a successful possession. There were no more encounters, except for occasionally a few years later, the demon would whisper death threats in their ear yeah. while they were on, <laughs> you know, for lunch. It's like, dude, that is actually still pretty serious. That makes me think it wasn't yeah. actually gone. Yeah. yeah. Terrifying. Yeah, that was Anna Eklund, right? They just like we did it. So yeah, the demon Kinda. has been expelled for now. a little bit. Some <laughs> of it mostly it gone. Yeah, it's a little leftover. It's fine. Don't worry <laughs> about it. 
But yeah, so that is the tragic and mysterious case of Julia, the queen of the satanic cult. Terrifying. Mm. Mm. Terrifying ending. Like the whole thing's terrifying from start to finish. And just a very different story. As you started, I'm going to be honest. I was like, oh my God, he's doing another demonic possession <laughs> exorcism thing. But this one is so different than the rest that it really does hold your attention. Yeah, for sure. That's all right. Strap your boots up because I don't think Dave's done covering exorcisms and I'm here for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Rock and roll. <laughs> Let's take a second to thank our patrons before we sign off here. Our VIPs, we have Allison V, Jeannie R, Justin T. We also have Justin T, Lisa J, Mike B, Mom and Pops W, Robert H, Stephen V, Demon King, and Irish Assassin Gaming. Thank you so much to our VIPs. Everybody else, we have Ambie Rose. We have Anna C, Even Better Hometown Ghost Stories, Garrett, Lily, IDJF, Batch, Jake V, Janice G, Mar Fire, Rachel B, Stephanie, I'm sorry, Stephanie A, Sydney B, Al Capone, Anthony T, Ashley M, Brandon W, Brennan B, Captain McSlugs, Cody G, Huggy Bear, Joe R, Carrie Lee J, Mark M, Matthew T, Mariah M, Papa Squatch, Paul from St. Louis, Sarah R, Scotty L, Solar Flare, Soph, and Hooper. Thank you guys so much for this. Little... Take a breath, Jesse. Yeah, we knocked that one out. Uh, for as little as $3 a month, you could be part of Patreon. For $20 a month, you could be a VIP. For $20 a month twice, you can be a VIP twice like Justin T. You can be now. one of our oubliettes. You can be an oubliette. That's what so is that the winner? About. That's the winning name for the... For I don't the know. VIP. It seems like the one that everyone likes. So, I mean, we can still debate it, but... Uh, or different tiers can have different names. So Who knows? I think that's just for fans of the show. I didn't think we... We're putting that just for Patreon, were we? Um, whatever. We can figure it out. You could be an oubliette if you want. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> if you wanted to be a, a dark, dank murder hole, you can be a dark, dank murder hole. That is right. That is the name that you can go by if you so choose. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oubliette is. That's right. If you folks like this video or this podcast, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Tap the little sub button. Turn on the notification bell. You know when we go live which is every Tuesday at 9 p.m., which is when we'll be back. But, but you can that, find some of our hidden episodes when we go live without telling anybody and play video games, then I never die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we stream a little Phasmophobia. I'm thinking, we need, Rob, we need to get you to download Devour and do a Devour stream because that is a jumpy, horrifying game. And uh, yeah, we do stuff like that. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already and drop us a five-star review. We'll read it out on the on the uh, live podcast. If you leave a review for us, yeah, anything else, gentlemen, it. it's going to do it for me. Dave, send us off. <laughs>